take you today back into Colossians, and we're just going to get started. So off we go. The verse I'm looking at today with you is uh, verse 14 of the first chapter. And this one is kind of really interesting, to me at least anyway, is really interesting. Let me read what it says. So Colossians 1, verse 14, it's page 11 or 1479, if you have a Bible like mine. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, here's the important thing. I've said this before, but for the sake of new listeners, first of all, there was no chapter in verse when the Apostle Paul wrote. He was writing a letter. It is very fluid, and I can't show you today because I don't have the right tools, but many times if you're reading some of the oldest extant manuscripts, you can see clearly as I, I'll show you something, but not for this exact demonstration of how we might see a sentence break by a dot that is placed at the end of a thought to the top, not to the bottom of the line of letters. I don't know if you remember how I said that starting at verse 13 begins kind of a new section forward, but it's this big kind of run-along sentence. Um, So we're going to look at that and something very interesting in this verse. So first thing, let's recap some basic knowledge for the folks just in general. We know anytime you see italics, how many of you have the word even italicized in your Bible? Raise your hand. If you're reading a King James, it'll be italicized. So we know that anything added in italics is added by the translators for the sake of the flow of our language. However, it's noteworthy to say that that word even does not appear in the Greek. Furthermore, what if I told you that there are also three other words that don't appear in the Greek? Not that it does any despite to our text, but it's just not there. So the words through his blood, believe it or not, are not in the original manuscripts. And I want to show you that. I don't like to just tell you things if I'm able to to give you an example of something. So let's do this. I will put up first, this is a piece of paper here that shows you the Vaticanus. So this is our verse 14 here. And we have here, uh, ikomen, ten, and then this apulo trosin, ten, afisin, ten, hamartion. There is no... There is no um, through his blood. That's the Vaticanus. But let's check out the Sinaiticus, which I put down here. These are uh, 3rd and 4th century manuscripts. We can see this is a big tomb here. And right down here, there's going to be some shadows, but we're going to see that's our text as well. Even if you can't read Greek, um, it is basically the same text as I just read out of the Vaticanus. This is the Sinaiticus which does not have the reference that the King James puts that is through his blood. Now, is that going to destroy the meaning of the text? No. But let me say a few words, because we've been talking about text and translation and the transmission of the text. So it's important to note, when when we have a text where there are words that are in our King James, but not in the oldest extant manuscripts, we can know certain things. One, first and foremost, that this section was added undoubtedly as a gloss, most likely by a scribe. And I'm going to say this more opinion than fact, because I can't pinpoint the date, but I'd say certainly after the 5th century. Why do I say it's a gloss? If you turn to Ephesians, you will see... That somebody who was familiar with Paul's writing, chapter 1 and verse 7, and we have something that looks very, very similar, in whom we have redemption through his blood, right? That's the same as verse 14 of the first chapter of Colossians, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, and we have here even the forgiveness of sins, 
And then the text goes on in Ephesians. So it's very clear that when we have these type of things, it's important for us to, first of all, put on the academic hat. Uh, A lot of people who are a little bit ignorant regarding the Bible, its transmission, and these old manuscripts will say, well, see, (laughs) the Bible's unreliable. Well, first of all, don't you know, don't get yourself in a bind here with making statements like that because when we go and do translation, we can see over time, not just, for example, the italics by the translate, but we can glean and we can see where scribes would have tried to make the text either appear more Pauline or um, there was something to smooth it out theologically. But the problem here is that Paul is not writing to explain to us the method of how. That's not his interest right now, of how we are brought to this point. Remember, in the earlier verse, when, it's, when we were reading this, he hath rescued us from the power of darkness and qualified us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So let's take a look at the text how it should read in Greek, but I want to show you this. There's times when I do translation to dig a little bit deeper. There's other times where I try to show, using the grammar, how things are held together in the mind of the writer that we might better understand a couple of things in the text. So this verse we have here in the Greek, and I'll write above, in, who... We have the, and I'm not going to use the King James redemption, and I'm going to start explaining why, so we're going to put the right terminology here. The ransom, the forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins, plural. There's only one verb in this Greek sentence, and it's important to see how this one verb holds everything together. The verb is we have. Now, not that that's anything staggering in and of itself, but it is a verb in the indicative, which means it's factual. It's in the present, which means now, ongoing, and continuous, and it is active, We have, we actively have, we actively possess, we've actively laid hold on. And now here we have two nouns that are governed by this verb. The noun for ransom, which is a noun in the accusative feminine singular, and the noun for forgiveness, which is the same. Noun, accusative, feminine, singular. So this one verb basically governs these two nouns. And why is this kind of a radical thing? I'm going to tell you why. Because when I read the text, in whom we have redemption, and I'm skipping to the forgiveness of sins, it seems as though if we were just reading the words from the King James, redemption, redeemed, versus the word ransom. And I have to start by explaining this word to show that redemption and ransom are not actually synonymous, number one. And number two, if you think about it, ransom basically says that there must be a price, much like if there was a hostage situation and you have to pay a ransom. There's something that is actively happening on the part of God. He must, he did, pay a price, and the forgiveness of sins, which, if you think about it, forgiveness is usually a concept we talk about as grace and the mercy of God. We don't do anything to merit it. It is basically bestowed upon us. So I want you to think about this. In this text, if you remove the word redemption and you replace it with the right word ransom, you have the concepts of what God needed to do in paying a price, which is more of the judicial side of God, and forgiveness, which is the mercy side of God. And interestingly enough, 
the Apostle Paul says, in whom we have these both dynamics, both mercy and judgment. Now, that may not seem quite radical to you, but it does to me appearing in one sentence. So, to better understand, first and foremost, this word ransom, the first thing, the first place I want to take you to is a few Hebrew words to understand how this all makes sense behind this one Greek word, apolutrosis. So let me write the word in the Greek phonetically for you. Apolutrosis. Looks something like that. And so if we were to go behind this word, this is Greek, if we were to go behind this word into the Hebrew, we would find three main words. And these words actually are important because once we define them, even though Hebrew, remember, is an ambiguous language, once we define these words, they will carry the connotation of the New Testament word for ransom. So first, let's take a look at this. The first word we have in the Hebrew is a word goel. And this word typically and traditionally is used in a familial way. So, For example, if we were talking about the kinsman redeemer, this word, every time it appears, it not just suggests, it really demands that it's a family member that in this Old Testament context would be father, son, or brother. Typically, a person who was goel redeemer, that's the way it's going to be translated initially, for the family, would have to undertake some very interesting tasks. For example, if your brother died and your sister was a widow, it would be your duty as the family goel, the person who is in the line, responsible, to take the widow to yourself and, in fact, play the role of goel. So there must be a family connection there, We have at least 10, but I believe it's 13 references where uh, God is the subject, Goel, and he is essentially establishing a familial pattern with his people, in this case towards the children of Israel. The second word would be Bada, and it might look something like that, not really. Bada has always carries with it the need to ransom or the need to redeem. But unlike Goel, you don't have to be a family member. You don't have to be related. I can redeem something like, for example, redeeming an animal. And there's um, many places in Exodus and Leviticus that give the prescription by God to redeem, ransom an animal, And you wouldn't use goel because we're not related, right? You would use the word pada. But in every case between goel and pada, there carries with it a price that must be paid. The third word is kapur. And that doesn't look like a very good pe. Kapur. Ka. Kapur. That should be the most known one of all. For any of the people familiar with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Covering, this one carries with it the same sense of an exchange, something that is substitutionary, but always with the context of a covering. So if we were to kind of take these apart, we would say that, for example, Kapur is is a covering but carries with it a price that needs to be paid. If you go back to, for example, the kapureth, the covering on the ark that had to be what? Sprinkled with blood. There's your covering in a sense. Pada has the substitutionary element to it where one may be ransoming or redeeming, but there is a substitutionary element. And goel, which is the family person who would take responsibility for redeeming for the family. Head of the family could be, as I said, subject could be used of God for Goel, subject could be used of God for Pada, 
I'm not 100% sure for Kapoor, but definitely they all point to the same thing but different dimensions. This is important. Why? Because when you look at, remember this is the code for the Septuagint. That is the Greek of the Hebrew text that was done two to 300 years before Christ. You're going to find that most of these words are being tra- or translating a combination of word groups that stem from this one word. So remember, apo is a prefix in the compound of lutrosis, which could be luo, could be lutro, could be lutron, could be lutrosis, and then there's a whole bunch of compounds that can go with it. My point is that all of these words, when you get into the Septuagint, there is no... There is no ability, if you were just reading the Septuagint, there is no ability to distinguish like I just did with the Hebrew, except you'd have to look to other Greek words, which luckily, when I did this, I was looking at different words and I found a few other words. So I'm very clear that this word that we're looking at in our text must function as a ransom concept. There must be a price paid. And when you understand, you can redeem something. And in terms of first in the secular and then in the Bible, you can redeem something without having to pay a ransom. And I want you to keep going back to the mindset of either manumission, emancipation of a slave that would have to be essentially a price paid to to buy that person's freedom, or if we're talking about it this way, we could, we could talk about a ransom, uh, anything that would be a payment that could be payment substituting in my place. So when we take these concepts and now we put them back in the text, something very good happens. Let's go back to the text. So the first thing we can say, what we have actively from the now and it's continuous, is a ransom that has been paid, and it's once insufficient that ransom has been paid. If we understand, even in part, what this means, we not only have essentially the price paid that then essentially makes possible the forgiveness of sins. In other words, I think a lot of times people just kind of treat the term of forgiveness of sins rather cheaply, and maybe that's why we have a lot of people who are, uh, we'll call it, they frustrate the grace of God and the, the concept of forgiveness that God says essentially your sins, my sins, are, they're washed away, they're gone. A failure to grab hold of this, what I'm explaining, brings people into my presence that will say, but I don't really know if God's forgiven me, or I don't, I'm not really sure that whole... Now, there's places to doubt. I'm, I'm going to be the first person to tell you there's places to doubt. That makes us human. But where there is no place to doubt, this is not the place to doubt. Either Jesus died on the cross, spilt his blood, and his blood was the payment for me to be washed and cleansed, or it wasn't. It's either or and not anything in the middle. Now, you find me a person who says either or, and I'll tell you that person understands at least the theological principle of price paid to achieve that forgiveness. But see, I find a lot of people over the years of ministry, are not clear about this. It costs something that God's son didn't come and just provide some cheap outlet. It costs something. You know, there's that expression, if it doesn't cost you anything, like you won't feel it or you won't be bothered by it. Well, it bothers me when people don't latch on to this and understand, probably stems from a lot of non-teaching or a lot of, we'll call them, cute little 10-minute homilies. But if you are standing in him, this verse starts off with, in whom, that is, in him. If you're standing in Christ, and you are in Christ, 
then do yourself a favor and quit standing in the middle of things. There is no middle ground. You are in Christ. The ransom, the price has been paid, sins forgiven. Now, this is why I said to you, it won't do too much trouble or despite to the text whether we take or leave through his blood, because theologically speaking, that's correct. But it's just not in the oldest manuscripts. Now, some people might say, well, why, why did Paul not include this? And I, I'm going to speculate. I always tell you when I have, that there, here's fact and here's speculation. I'm going to speculate, because it wasn't his focus. As we go on to read this section that goes uh, all the way, will take us all the way into uh, almost the end of the chapter, not quite. You're going to find the focus more and more, almost like a laser, focusing our mind and our attention on Christ. So the idea in this verse was not to mm, start some theological treaties on the how. The how would be through his blood. Paul does not seem to be interested with that right now. Now, different story to the Ephesians, where that was his focus and that was his interest. He was interested there in explaining that the wall of partition has been broken down between Jew and Gentile. He was very fixated on the how there, but not here. And as we go, this will become more and more clear as to the why part. Now, here we get into some interesting things about this text. So, the first thing, apolutrosin, or ransom. First thing we're going to look at is the problem. That's the first thing we're going to look at. Why this ransom, and this word has to be ransom and not redemption. It's important because if we were to take the word, the English word redemption, and give it its equivalent in the Greek, it's not this word we're looking for at all. So the first problem is the fall. Because of the fall, we are essentially in need. This, this chapter will go on to talk about being reconciled back to him. That's, a, that's going to be a whole different section. But this is the problem. How could we be reconciled except there be a price paid? So this word comes into play heavily. The second thing that we have here is a problem uh, as a result of the fall and then subsequently everything that happens thereafter is sin. And let's, put some, let's put a few things here. We have Genesis here. We have Romans 3.23 here. The problem is sin. The next problem we have, these are tied together. Separation from God. Why the Bible in Isaiah 59, and hope you can make out some of my scribbles here, the Bible says basically your sin has separated you from God. So if we have our problem understood aright, let's keep going here. There's more to this. We are naturally... darkened mind, or we could say the carnal mind is at enmity, Romans 8, 7, forward. We don't have the ability without this ransom, without this price, to think, even to think right. The flesh is weak. That is a fact. Remember what Paul said, what I find myself doing I essentially don't want to do, and the things I want to do, I'm not doing. That's the nutshell. That's the Scott version. So it's pretty plain to see. We've got a lot of problems here. No other way of salvation. A lot of people are not going to like what I'm going to say, and that's good. You have the right to your opinion. This is not my opinion. This is from this book. If this book is wrong, then, oh, we have a big problem. But it's not my opinion. Price must be paid. First Timothy 2 and 6, if you can we'll put a, an I there so you know it's Timothy. So we have the problem. 
this is why we need this ransom, why we need to be essentially ransomed. Now, if we go this way, there's a plan. These are simple things, but it it should put enough stuff underneath the verse that you stop and think about it in a completely... And I want you to think about this verse first and foremost in an analytical way, in, in a theological way, before you can put any other feeling, any other emotion, any other understanding. This has to be understood as plain as day. The plan. One, God sent his only son. We know that. It's John 3.16. Whoops. John 3.16. That anyone who comes, he says, anyone can come. And anyone who does, I will in no wise cast out. It means all, all can come. Do all come? No. See, this is, this is the mystery of it all. I mean, you, if you come to understand what's being said here, why wouldn't you? What do you have to lose? Now, either Jesus is a nut, a liar, a fruitcake, or when he said, anyone who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out as true. Now, if you look at the track record of the people that came to him, you got a, at the, the beginning of the list of his disciples. You've got a collection of people that we could say we see some of our personalities in them. And he took them and accepted them exactly the way they were. He didn't say, get cleaned up, go and recite many prayers, go answer the altar call, go ring the bells, go be an acolyte, go do this, go do that, do, 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 do. Nope. Didn't say any of that. Know what he said? He said, follow me. This is the mystery of people who make Christianity something very mystical. This is a thinking person's religion. Brains are required here. Now, when he said, follow me, I'm sure at that moment, we we are very quick to think, that okay. (laughs) But no, the talk of Christ, this Jesus of Nazareth, had been circulating. Miracles were being performed that unprecedentedly had never been seen before. So we could talk about a lot of different things, but the fact of the matter is when you start examining this, you see God does actually have a plan and that the plan works this way. In him. In him we have salvation. In him we have forgiveness of sins. And the list goes on and on and on and on. So one cannot be a Christian, and I I have to repeat this. I was talking about this two or three messages back. There are way too many people out there that don't understand there's only two types of people. You're either in Adam or in Christ. Now, we are still wearing Adam bodies, but we are in Adam in Christ, or you're just in Adam. There's, There's nothing else, folks. You know, over the last 15 years, I've said many things like there's only two types of people. Well, here are only two categories. You're either in him or you're not. And isn't that sad that there's a, a, a sea of people out there that just almost like some cloud, some gaseous cloud, they can morph in and out of these words without even contemplating the magnitude. Being in Christ means I'm in him and he's in me. I know these are strange concepts for people outside of the body of Christ. But don't come into the church, any church, without understanding it's in him. And anything short of in him is not going to fly. These are the requirements, part of the plan. He, He doesn't say you can be a little bit in him, like someone who's a little bit pregnant. You either are or you're not. Okay? Four, as part of the plan, I know this will sit well with many, sign of Jonah. Too many people don't understand this concept. That's Matthew 12 and verse 39. Sign of Jonah, the plan that God would send his only, his only begotten son, that he would die. The sign of Jonah is those three days and three nights in the big fish's belly. 
that typify the resurrection. So as we go through this, we have kind of, it'll, it'll all lead back to this in the fullness of time. God sent forth, go back to number one, his only begotten son. That means that God's plan was at a set time, at a set moment, where everything that had been prepared kind of put into motion this plan. This plan also consisted of his name, Jesus, because why? He shall save his people. You know, the rest of the verse We come back to the same thing that's part of the problem. He will pay the price. That's part of the plan, which takes you back to the sign of Jonah. These are all interconnected. Okay, we need another page, folks. (laughs) It's a good problem. All right, we have the problem. We have the plan. Let's talk about something very simple here, because I've covered it many times, the price. You notice something? Paul, in his writing, doesn't just talk about, even though that's not in the text, but even out of Ephesians, through his blood, the shed blood. He doesn't just talk about the blood. Because I guess you could do a little bloodletting and not the person doesn't have to die, but the price is the blood fully shed, which equals death, the death of Christ mandatory, not discussable, which also requires that he be in the grave. It's just a repetition of what I've just said, that he raise up on the third day, that he was seen, that he's coming back. That's part of the price, not finished yet, and the word. The word did not come as we are able to enjoy the word of God freely. The word even came at a price. That price obviously takes you back to the death of Christ. Had Christ not come on the scene, on the stage of history, and spoken the word, not just the Logos word, which he was, but the Rima, the sayings of God, these all brought about by the religious leaders his crucifixion, his death and crucifixion. That brings us down to another thing right here, the purpose. Don't think that the purpose and the plan are the same, but I'll just tell you, because these are a whole bunch of R R words that start with to redeem us, but as we saw in our text of two weeks ago, to rescue us, we'll see again in the 20th verse forward of the first chapter of Colossians, to reconcile us, to restore, the list goes on. So, There's this concept, everything that has re attached to it as a redo, but not as in take two, as in redo, you are a new creature in Christ. That's the type of thing we're talking about. That's the purpose, to take you from the state you were in, qualify you for the heavenlies. Now you're here, and all of these R words that I just said have to come into play, but the biggest one is part of my word, that we're looking at, ransom. If you go back into the language of the Old Testament, you're going to find some very interesting things. When God says that he brought the children of Israel out of the bondage from Egypt with an uplifted hand or with a high hand, and you'll look to another text which has redeemed, you're going to find these, the Hebrew words I covered, convey a whole host of concepts. They all circle around each other, whether it's substitution, the high priest placing his hand on the head of an animal who had to die, that we'll call it transference, but also substitutionary work. So these all come into play. These are all part of the purpose. And if I were to drive home the point with the final P, it would be the proof. Now, somebody... We'll call it the, the people who are always the uh, the doubters, the ones that, that have the issues. They'll say, well, you can't prove any of this. Well, how about this? If I just take what's in this book 
And I start with, for example, the book of Leviticus, and I look at the laws of offering. Each one of those laws from burnt offering down the line, they weren't, the burnt offering was something completely offered, the, the word traditionally used for burnt offering, holocaust, completely offered up. These were offerings that God prescribed. The first one, by the way, was for God's good pleasure. But as you move down the line, they addressed each of the conditions of humankind in our short fallingness. So like the book of Hebrews that talks about not that the blood of bulls and goats could do anything to redeem us, but that Christ once and for all paid that price, we begin to understand that this is not a new concept, that from cover to cover... As much as people don't want to face it, they don't want to acknowledge it from cover to cover, we have a stream of flowing blood that is God's way of saying, this is how I will redeem. This is how I will ransom. This is how I will accomplish my purpose. Blood must be shed. Look to the garden. And immediately, when God saw that they, in their works, covered themselves, when they knew they were naked, covered themselves with fig leaves, God said that won't suffice. That act of covering with fig leaves represented to them in their time works of trying to save and cover oneself. And God said that'll never fly with me, which is why it says that he killed animals and they wore the skins of the animals. Their blood was shed for them at that moment. And as you go through the book, you realize that God through and through has said there is a price to pay. Now, This is why I love doing the grammar as I do it, because remember that Greek word, ikomen, which is to have, to hold, to possess. And you can use it however you want in these. I went through looking at how we might best understand this word, if we to have, to hold, to possess, and the word for ransom and forgiveness. And something radical occurred to me. If the problem, I think, with many people is they don't necessarily believe that they have received and possess something that is essentially kind of like I've explained about the deposit of the Holy Spirit. Remember, I've talked about that out of Ephesians where it says God gave us the earnest, the part payment, deposit of the Holy Spirit by placing his nature in us. Well, here we have a similar thing with this verb for to have, to have, to hold, to possess. That is that if you think about it, if I just use the word redeemed, not ransom, if I just use the word redeemed and said I've been redeemed by God, I wouldn't be able to express something that I hold dearly to, which is a price. Redeemed could carry a price, but ransom most certainly does. That says... I actually possess a part of this. The part that I possess is the part that I'm in him, he's in me. Now, don't say, well, that's just mere rhetoric. It's not. It's a theologically sound doctrine that says, if I have received, and I have received of him, and I have placed my faith in him, then there is no error in me saying that I possess, I hold on to, I see the price that was paid, I can say I possess a part of that. I do not possess the blood. I cannot fix myself, save myself, cleanse myself, but what I possess, go back to the opening of this verse, in whom? There is my possession, in whom? So, you know, it changes the way we understand the concept of ransom and forgiveness, and specifically for those people who are chronically wrestling with this forgiveness of sins. I cannot tell you, as I said, in the years of ministry, how I have seen people, and there are people who read the Bible, there are people who pray, but they've never settled this to the core. This has to be something where there is no gray area. There are other areas of our faith Ask me to talk about the Trinity, and you might say, there's some gray areas there because we can't know. We see through a glass darkly. This one is crystal clear. So why is it that we don't have more people looking at this and saying, I possess something? Now, you know, we used to sing a song here. I long to be his possession. 
he is my everything. But actually, I already do, in a sense, possess. My faith possesses. So when I say we have, we have the ransom, we also have, that brings about the forgiveness of sins. There's something that I can say I hold on to. Now, for those people who are wondering, well, how do you hold on to something you don't have? Well, I just told you. The operation is by faith. So let's look again at this. In whom, as your King James reads, in whom we have, and I'm going to use it this way, been ransomed, the forgiveness of sins. Now that it doesn't seem to flow, now you can see why we would add words like the word even, even though it's not even, though even is not in the text. Had to say it like that. But what we can see from this and definitely is crystal clear. So let's, let's take a little spin with our words now kind of clear for us. And I'm going to take you through some of the Greek words that will kind of shape the background of everything here. So first, as I was giving you the examples, this word lutron, which is part of our apolutrosis word, found in one passage that says, For the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life, and it's translated just like this, a ransom for many. So you have it, that is where it occurs. Then there's another word from the same word grouping, and I'm writing these in English phonetically for you. We find the use of this in the passage in Luke regarding the two disciples on the Emos Road, when they said we'd hoped it was he which should redeem Israel. The use here, again, if analyzed properly, is a Jewish understanding, not even a New Testament understanding. It's a Jewish understanding as typical of how they believe that God would liberate his people from their enemies and usher in a period of victory and peace. So this is more of a a Jewish understanding. And then in Titus 2.14... We have this Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. So over and over again, if you were to look for these words, the precious blood of a lamb without blemish and spot, even the blood of Christ, we find this, all of these meanings. First of all, let's, let's kind of start wrapping this up. So what we have, the reason why I address these Hebrew words is because they all tie together. So when we think about Christ and paying the ransom. I want you to think of it this way. Christ is indeed our goel in terms of family. We talk about how the Bible says adoption of sons, how we've become the children of God and heirs accordingly. That's what Galatians spells out for us. So if we have a familial relationship, Christ indeed is our kinsman redeemer. He is the family relations to redeem, to ransom, to do his part. If we take the word pada, his work was substitutionary. In other words, he died in my place that I might live. So we have that dimension there. And remember I said pada does not necessarily require a familial relationship, but carries that substitutionary concept, so we have that. And then kapur, which is Christ is my covering. So I love the fact that if you take all of the Hebrew words and stuff them into the Greek word, you have basically the most, we'll call it the the best shades of all the meanings of the words that are tied into one. And it becomes very clear to me that it cannot carry one shade of meaning alone. So as you see, I've kind of painted the words here. Let's take a look at where some of these other occurrences are and how we might add a little bit to our understanding. If you will, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6. And hopefully as we go, this concept is getting more and more and more clear. So 1 Corinthians 6, and the verse there would be 20. And this is one that most people can recite without... Question, for ye are bought with a price. What price? Doesn't that speak of something of what I was just saying without using the word ransom? 
You're bought with a price. It costs something to bring you into the kingdom. See, again, if I could, if I could just talk to those people who make Christianity such a kind of weak milk toast thing, rather than understanding the depth of this, to say you're bought with a price, says it as plain as day. There's no question. Your salvation and my salvation came at a very expensive price. If you'll take a look with me, turn to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, fifth chapter. We'll see it there too. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed. And that word redeemed is not any of the words I've spoken of today. It's that word agorazo. That is to buy out of the market, to take off the market and to take for himself. Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. So think on what I'm saying Now, there's other reasons, by the way, for ransom. And I'll tell you what they are. In fact, I'll take you there so it's it's a little bit more clear. If you're wanting to turn there with me, if not, just listen to me. Galatians 3 and verse 13. There's other things that Christ has done in, in the department of paying the ultimate price. This one, Galatians 3, 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So the curse fell on him that we could come out from underneath it. The whole world, by the way, is still under the curse for those people who adhere to the law. And if you don't, I should put this in in passing because too many people think when I say that that there isn't a standard. But yet Christ took the law and he didn't lower the bar He raised the bar so high. The law, no one, let's just get this straight. Let's, you know, there'll be people you talk to who are of the Jewish faith who believe that they can keep the law. That's insanity. The law is not just the Ten Commandments. The law is 316 do's and don'ts. And I guarantee you, even the most religious orthodox, it's it's almost impossible. And I would say almost impossible. There's some who believe that they keep the law to a T. Well, good luck for you, because if you know what's in the law, it's kind of like, come on, really, God, what, what were you thinking? <laughs> but take that and lift the bar. Don't lower the bar. See, this is where people make the mistake. They all, oh, Christ came, and Christ is like a Birkenstock hippie, hippie. You know, he's cool, and he's laid back. No, he took that bar of the law that was here and took it past the roof when he said, you've heard it said to you, for example... Thou shalt not kill. But he says, if you hate in your heart, you're as guilty as a murderer. He takes not the action of doing, but the thought now and puts it in a level. Well, let me ask you something. Who can keep that standard? Is there anyone? Thank you. Because there's no one. And this is why the, the many things where he said, you've heard it said unto you, but behold, I say. He was saying, all that was before... See, even the people that argue about this, you know, tithing and where it says, you know, he addresses the people, and it's very specific. I don't know how people miss this when he says, you know, you Pharisees, you tithe of the smallest things, mint and cumin, but you neglect the weightier things. And he's talking about righteousness, justice, the things of God that are This is very interesting. Have you ever thought about what he was talking about when he said you tithe of these things that essentially mint, cumin, anise? These are things that basically grow like weeds and are in abundance. If you've ever seen, you know what mint looks like. Mint grows and it grows and it grows. And if you plant it, it's like it can take over the world. So you're, you're basically worried about tithing out of the abundance of the things you have, but you're not concerned about the heavier, more complex matters of God. So it's important for us to see even there what Christ was addressing. We can, you know, we can have our, our, and many people do, they have these pet things, you know, I don't tithe, that's an Old Testament. And again, that proves the point. They miss the whole concept, which is if your heart, this is what Jesus spoke about, 
The same thing Isaiah spoke about. If your heart is not in this and you're just producing lip service, that's all you will bring to God is lip service, nothing else. But if your heart's in this, you're going to be looking at the weightier, more important things. This is why I'm drawing the attention to this concept of ransom because it can never be treated cheaply. Failure to understand the price is failure to understand how much it costs to save you and to save me. And just so you know, this apolytrosis word, in the day that this was written, would carry infinitely more weight than it may today, because at the time of this writing, there was an estimated 60 million slaves of Rome. So think about that. If you're a slave, you want to be set free, unless you are in good circumstances. I can't fathom anybody wants to be enslaved. But specifically for that day and age, this word would have had set lights off. Why? Because people still were enslaved in that day. So what would be the price to set you free? What is the price to set someone free? If I've addressed the ransom word, and I'm, it's very hard to do anything exhaustive in an hour. I can exhaust you, but I can't exhaust the subject. <laughs> then let's talk for a few minutes about the concept of forgiveness, because that's, that's where I want to end my message, but I want to say a few words before then. So I'm going to take you back, and we're going to look at the text one more time. So forgiveness of sins, and I'm going to take you back to the text. So we're talking here about the forgiveness of sins, which becomes something really complicated for us human beings. Do you know why? Because we do something that no other creature, created being, does. We like to live in denial. We like to live under the auspices that as long as people think we are actually better than we are, we can live with ourselves. The problem is God knows what we are. Now, this is the last part of this message is not to condemn. It's not to abase. It's to say you'll find something. When you bring all of this to God, There is a liberating moment. It may not happen immediately. I've told you in my case, I had to keep going back, and I had to keep going back, and I've learned the lesson of what to do now. When things come up, I have to keep going back. I have to keep bringing it back to him. But you know when you have been released, even let's talk about the things we know about, the things we don't know about, the things we've done, the things we've said, all of these things. It says forgiveness of sins, which encompasses All of it. Now imagine that. And so when I say to you, people who come in to the church or they want to talk to me, and they're not recognizing release means release. It means the gate was open, the water went out, empty. There's nothing left. It's been cleaned out. It's been cleansed. Just like the ransom that had that cleansing effect, the forgiveness of sins is just like that. Our problem is, is that we sin perpetually. Anybody who tells you that they don't, the Bible says anyone who says they don't sin is a liar, and that, there has not been a more truer statement than that, all sin, we all do. And don't say, oh, I did that 10 years ago before I got saved and sanctified. Then you're also a liar. (laughs) So you have something else to talk to God about. But what I'm saying to you is, once you wrap your mind around this, there's something really amazing that comes out of this verse. This word or this verb we have that is active and in the present says, I possess something that essentially is not possessible, but because of my faith, I possess it. The ransom paid, I'm, it's bought and paid for. The forgiveness of sins, it is done. This is why you'll see there is a transition here in, in our text going into the 15th verse, which starts moving to the focus away from we'll call, we'll say what Christ has accomplished to the person of Christ himself. And we get into some very deep uh, Christocentric verses, which I'm very eager to get into because that is the force of what we do here. But in the meantime, and until we get to those verses, all I want to say to you is if there are people that came in today or you're listening in the sound of my voice and it's still kind of one of those things where you just, it's just not clear There's no peace inside. I'm asking you to go back and reflect on what I've said 
and take a look at this verse and maybe go through and look at the various references, not just in Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians. There's references in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Peter, but they all are saying the same thing over and over again, unmistakably. How, how amazing that God would essentially condescend, bend down, and I speak for me. You have to speak for you. I can't speak in a global way. I can only speak for me. How amazing that God bent down, condescended to touch me, to ransom me, and then to release me of all my sins. Now I ask you something. What do I have to complain about? I'm not, I'm not telling you that life is ever always easy or that things are, things are not always great. But if I put it all in perspective, if I'm not looking at the day's current events, I'm looking at my soul in eternity, what do I have to complain about? Or better yet, much gratitude and praise that he decided to choose me and that he decided to choose you truly is amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, and thank God I can see. And thank God for the sight you have and you've received. Hopefully this clears up a little bit of the subject as we forge forward in our series, and hopefully I've helped at least one person today to get rid of that cloud of confusion that sits on many people, not certain about whether or not it's all done. What were his final words on the cross? It is finished, period. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www. Dot pastor melissa scott dot com